welcome to robotics 2 in today's class we are going to talk about sensors and this is very important because what i want to do is we i want to actually access the sensors that we have in our mambo drone and we talked about it we have an ultrasonic range finder we have a downward facing camera there is a barometer and there is an imu and with matlab we can acquire all this data and actually fuse it to the system so so if you look at the architecture of the the drone or unmanned or uh, uh, unmanned fly or autonomous flying vehicle you have the unmanned vehicle and the unmanned vehicle has some sensors so you have sensors like a barometer you have a sensors like accelerometer gyro sometimes you have a downward facing camera all these sensors are noisy so data coming from sensor is not very accurate so what we want to do is we want to capture this noisy data and then estimate the best possible solution so this chapter we are going to talk about different types of sensors next chapter is on the state estimation and kalman filtering so the, the type of filtering that is used inside the drone then we go on to the we try to find out the error in the position we correct that we apply some type of path planning algorithm we, we provide waypoints and the uav follows those waypoints and then we have the path manager and at the top level we have something called as the path planner so these are the steps and very important that we have different types of sensors that are commonly used in guidance and control some issue with zoom so what i'm going to do is yeah thank you i'm going to uh zoom is not switching Okay, one of those days when the Zoom is not working. So bear with me a second. Okay. won't be able to annotate but at least i would be able to discuss the slides so these are the different types of sensors we have accelerometers we have rate gyros we have pressure sensors we have magnetometer and we have global positioning system uh, inside mambo we don't have gps but if you are going to use the mambo with the optical tracking system you can actually mount a, a marker and that will provide the absolute positioning on the mambo so basically uh, you would be able to create your indoor gps type of system with an optical tracker so for that it is very important that you know how to operate the optical tracking system how to collect data and how to interface so we use accelerometers to measure acceleration now it is very important that we understand the accelerometers major specific force what is that specific force specific force is because of the acceleration the self acceleration of the vehicle 
and the gravitational acceleration, the proof mass deflects and that deflection is measured by the accelerometer. So if you get asked, uh, what does accelerometer measure? Men's accelerometers do not measure acceleration. They measure specific force. What that means is if you have your cell phone and there is an accelerometer laying flat, you will measure the acceleration of 1G, even though your cell phone is not moving because the specific force is 1G. And as you can see, the equation for accelerometer is mx double dot is equal to k minus the displace, relative displacement. You can use the Laplace transform and come up with a transfer function that gives you the displacement x or the acceleration measurement with respect to the displacement. Now, one thing I want you to understand that accelerometer has some built-in errors. And these errors, we cannot eliminate, but we can minimize. So an accelerometer would have something called as the scale factor, which is like relating the, the voltage out of the accelerometer to the, the actual acceleration. It will also have something called as the bias. Let me give you a very simple example your bathroom weighing scale. Bathroom weighing scale, if it is going to measure, uh, if it's going to show you five pounds, even if it's not loaded, which means the bias is five pounds. So if you step on it, and if it reads 185 pounds, you can say my actual weight is 180 pounds. But sometimes the bias shifts. So bias changes. And then somehow we have to track this changing bias. And this bias change could be because of the temperature. It could be because of some cross axis effect. It could be because of the misalignment. So somehow we need to come up with a mathematical model that will take that acceleration data and give us best possible estimate. There, there are actually two types of errors. There are random errors and systematic errors. Some errors are constant. And if they remain constant, you can take them off. But if the rare errors <laughs> keep on changing, what you can do is you can use filtering tools or some type of statistical analysis to minimize the effect of errors. And at the end, what we want to do is we want to capture the data from these different sensors, which are noisy, and come up with the best possible estimate. Now, if you think about it, and if you have taken linear algebra, this determination or estimation problem is something similar to the least square problem, which means you are trying to minimize the error between the actual value and the measured value. And if you perform this statically, you have complementary filter. If you perform this dynamically, you have a Kalman filter. So state estimation is very, very important. Whether you use LIDAR, whether you use accelerometer, whether you use gyro, estimation uh, is, is very important concept. And we are going to spend one entire chapter on estimation. If you were to take a zoom view under scanning electron microscope, what you see on the left hand side is the die. And I want you to note, this is the analog devices accelerometer. It has a proof mass, so basically a mass, and there are springs that are attached to it. So as that whole system, that whole sensor moves, the proof mass deflects, and that deflection gives rise to differential capacitance because of the fingers. So this differential capacitance is converted into voltage. Please understand, measuring capacitance is very, very hard because capac capacitance values are very small. You cannot measure those with your capacitance meter or multimeter. So the idea is you take this capacitance and convert that into a voltage output. If you have studied strain gauges, 
the, if the problem is exactly the same. If you have a strain gauge, the resistance of the strain gauge changes under the load. But the change in the resistance is so small that if you use your multimeter, you won't be able to detect it. So what we do is we create a Wheatstone bridge network that will take that change in the resistance and convert into change in the voltage. That change in the voltage is sort of amplified value of the change in the resistance. And that change in the resistance, now we can measure measuring change in the voltage. Exact same thing happens here. Accelerometers work on the principle that you have these fingers, you have this proof mass, this proof mass vibrates under acceleration or moves, the relative distance between these plates changes and because of the change in the distance, the capacitance changes. But that capacitance change is very, very small. So we have to use something like an induction network to convert that change in the capacitance to change in the voltage so we can accurately measure it. But there are problems because if you have the signal conditioning circuitry, which is very noisy, then your noise floor would be so high that your signal, you won't be able to capture. So you have to design a low noise signal conditioning to make sure your accelerometer works. But this is the dial. And that is the scanning electron microscope of um, image of accelerometer. I want you to notice that there are fixed and moving fingers around it. This accelerometer is a two dimensional accelerometer, which means it can measure the acceleration in the X direction and acceleration in the Y direction. Nowadays, there are three dimension accelerometers. So you can measure accelerations in X, Y and Z direction. So now how do you measure acceleration? Please understand the principle is acceleration is measured using the specific force. So we find out the force acting on the proof mass, which is the total force minus the force of gravity, divide that by the mass value and that gives us the acceleration. If we set an accelerometer on the tabletop, it will measure one because even though the force is zero, the gravity is acting on that accelerometer. Now, again, accelerometer, how would you basically, if you want to measure the accelerations in multiple dimensions, how would you do that? Clearly, what you want to do is you want to measure, there are different ways of doing it. So you can actually have something called as the triad. You can have three accelerometers which are perpendicular to each other. But when you have the accelerometer configuration perpendicular to each other, it's impossible to get 90 degrees between the accelerometers because of the die orientation, because of the packaging orientation. So what you need to do is you need to perform something called as the cross axis calibration. And with a cross axis calibration, you get a calibration matrix. And once you multiply the acceleration measurements with that calibration matrix, you get the true values of the acceleration. And calibration is an important step in the acceleration uh, uh, calibration. I mean, acceleration uh, using using accelerometers to measure acceleration. Uh, imagine you have an aircraft and you have the accelerometer that is fitted at the center of gravity. So what you have is you have the thrust, you have the drag, you have the lift, you have the force of the gravity and accelerometer does not know what if, if the force is because of the gravity, force is because of the lift, force is because of the thrust. What accelerometer does, it, it actually sums all the forces and find that finds out the total force that is acting on the accelerometer that is causing that proof mass to deflect. So with accelerometer, we can find out the total force or the total specific force, but we won't be able to find out or accelerometer will not tell us whether the force is because of gravity, drag, lift or thrust. Now, 
this is an expression that we have been talking about for a long, long time. Remember the expression that you see at the bottom is the first three equations out of those 12 state equations. The only thing is I have added the terms because of the gravity. For an example, when the aircraft is pitching up, then the accelerometer is going to measure the component of gravity around its pitch axis. When the aircraft is pitching and rolling, then the accelerometer is going to measure the, the gravity component of gravity, which is cosine theta sine p. And then the acceleration in the z direction is going to be g cosine theta and cosine phi. So because please understand, if you have a, a UAV, if it pitches up, then you have the comp gravitational acceleration is like this. So you have a component of gravitational acceleration along the x-axis. And if the aircraft is rolling and pitching, then you are going to have a component of acceleration in the x direction, component of acceleration in the y direction. And those are given by respective roll and pitch orientation. So basically, we are resolving the gravitational force in uh, those two axes. Now, so if you look at the acceleration model, and if you want to gradually include the additional force terms, so you will see that you have the basic acceleration model, and then the every accelerometer would have some type of yeah. So is it possible to generate say for the gravitational vector you turn that as constant either orientation or your velocity? Is it possible to determine what that vector is without being able to know like orientation? You can obviously use the cell model usually determine the orientation. Is it possible to determine what gravity is without knowing your orientation or your velocity? Gravity is always going to be one G going vertically down. But you, you need to know where that vertically down is. If you have an accelerometer flat, it's going to measure one G. But if it is inclined, it will not measure one G. It will measure slightly less. And that, that is how we measure orientation. But without a reference, we won't be able to measure the, the comfort or uh, the value of the gravitational acceleration in X, Y, and Z direction. Uh, well, uh, there are some techniques that people have talked about, basically uh, using uh, lasers and uh, time of flight and other stuff. Uh, but in my practice, actual experience, we have always used uh, accelerometers. There is one way you can do it. If you have gyroscope, then basically you can get the gyro reading and integrate the gyroscope measurement and you can get an angle. Uh, but the, the thing here is the gyroscope angles are correct when the motion is very fast. Accelerometer angles are correct when the motion is slow. So now you have two estimates of angle. One estimate is good when the motion is slow. One estimate is good when the motion is fast. And somehow we want to fuse these and find the least square solution that is sort of optimal. And that is the basis of complementary filter and Kalman filter, but we'll talk about it. So this is the acceleration model uh, in the most simple format. Every accelerometer will have some type of noise. You will never get acceleration signal perfectly flat. You are gonna have some type of variation and that variation is captured in the last term, that is uh, basically the variance or the, the noise in the accelerometer. The next concept is the MEMS gyro. MEMS gyro, they work on the Coriolis principle. And I gave this example in the past. Say if you're on a merry-go-round, if you try to walk towards the center, you will feel a sideways push because the merry-go-round is rotating. That is because of the Coriolis effect. So what you have is, you have a proof mass. That proof mass is vibrating in one orientation. And as soon as it experiences rotation, 
in the the proof mass which was initially vibrating like this because of the rotation it will start vibrating in the other orientation so what you do is you measure the amplitude of vibration in out of plane and that gives you uh, the the gyroscope or the angular ray and as you can see that usually at the end you have the voltage that comes out of the gyroscope you have uh, some type of an L factor and that gives you the actual angular rate. And uh, there are multiple types of gyros. So when I started working, we used to have fiber optic gyros. So what is the principle of a fiber optic gyro? The idea is you have this fiber optic cable, a very, very long cable. And basically uh, light uh, goes, actually they shine light that passes through this fiber optic cable. And what happens is, Basically, if there are actually two beams of light and when you rotate, what happens is the amount of time the light takes to travel through that fiber optic cable is very, very fractionally small. That's this small change because of the rotation is captured by the, the, the receiver and you find out the angular rate. Fiber optic gyros are very stable but they were very, very expensive. Nowadays, the trend here is the fiber optic gyros are being replaced with the MEMS gyros. So nowadays, if you see the uh, air data heading reference systems, or if you look at the actual uh, uh, sensor hardware, most of it is based on the MEMS system. And this is how the gyro looks like. So I want you to understand that again there is a proof mass and now it's being actuated uh, in this plane in x plane or uh, in x direction and once this gyro rotates because of the Coriolis force this mass which is oscillating in the x direction start oscillating in the y direction and these oscillations are proportional to the angular rate and then again the idea is you measure the change in the capacitance and this change in the capacitance is related. Somehow you relate that to the change in the voltage and that change in the voltage is related with angular rate. So now this is another thing that I want to talk about. If you have a gyro, uh, unfortunately gyros have something called as the startup bias. What that means is when you start the gyro, gyro could start at zero degrees per second, 20 degrees per second, 80 degrees per second. So it has a startup bias and it always changes. So whenever you design an inertial measurement unit, what you do is you capture the gyro data for certain period of time, let that gyro stabilize, and then you find that average and then subtract that from subsequent measurement. So there is always a startup bias with the gyro. So B gyro X, B gyro Y, and B gyro Z is the startup bias. But unlike accelerometer, this startup bias is not constant. Every time you turn the accelerometer on, the bias is going to be different. So for that, what you do is there's a technique which is called as Allen variance. So you perform the Allen variance, you find out the time it takes for the gyro to stabilize and, and you let that gyro run for that time period and then capture the startup value and then subsequently uh, uh, take it out from the measurement. Then gyros will also have some type of noise and you have to design some type of, of filtering approach where that noise is minimized. And at the end, you want this system with three accelerometer, three gyros working together to give you a good estimate of position and orientation. Sometimes you have a barometer. Now, what is a barometer? Barometer is used to measure pressure. And you can measure absolute pressure and you can measure the relative or differential pressure. Absolute pressure 
gives you the height from the mean sea level. So as you go up, pressure goes on decreasing. So if you have a barometer, the barometer will approximately tell you how far are you from the mean sea level. However, we also have a, a differential pressure. So differential pressure is used to measure the air speed. So what happens is when the moving air comes in contact with the stationary pitot and static tube, which is connected to the pressure sensor, the velocity energy gets converted to pressure energy. And we can use Bernoulli's principle to find out the value of incoming velocity. So something very important I, I, I want to tell you that I know some of you do not have background in fluid mechanics or you have not done anything uh, related to fluids, thermofluids. But this concept is very, very important. And that is used in a lot of applications such as this. So I want to actually give you some pointers that will help you uh, when you are trying to design a thermofluid system. So remember this important equation, P is equal to H rho G. Remember at some point in uh, your career, you must have seen this P, which is the pressure, H, which is the height, rho is the density, and the G, which is the gravitational acceleration. Conservation of energy, that law is valid for fluids. So please understand, we have conservation of energy. So energy conversation, conservation. So what are the types of energies? We have potential energy. We have kinetic energy. And if we are dealing with fluids, we have pressure energy. So when we have, when, if you think about it, when we are looking, uh, we study the energy for the solid bodies or objects, we only look at potential energy and kinetic energy. That is what we looked at in robotics one. We derived potential energy, kinetic energy from the Lagrangian and derived the differential equations of motion. But in fluids, in addition to pressure, uh, potential energy, in addition to kinetic energy, you have pressure energy. And you will see this concept everywhere. When you are studying these energies in the context of fluids, typically these energies are expressed as heads. So, and this is given in terms of meters. So what I would do is I would encourage you to think about Look at the specification for a pump. They will say this pump is able to generate 10 meters of head. This pump is able to generate 15 meters of head. What that means is that pump can take one Newton of fluid and raise it to 10 meters or raise it to one meters or raise it to 5 meters. So head is defined as energy per unit Newton of fluid. Now this may seem a little bit weird, but please understand this actually makes sense. Energy is force multiplied by displacement. So you have force or energy is equal to work. So this is force multiplied by displacement divided by Newton, which is force. And now what we have is we have the unit of distance, which is meter. So I can write down energy in terms of uh, a unit of dimension, which is like a length unit. So what happens is I can represent potential energy, which is potential energy expression is given as M times G times H, kinetic energy, 
which is given as one half m v square and pressure energy is given as h times rho times g and i want you to understand this because unfortunately this concept is not discussed in detail but if you were to design any mechatronic system that includes hydraulics pneumatics or some type of fluid power these terms will come so i have a potential energy the potential energy is given in joules kinetic energy is given in joules and pressure energy is also say uh, given in joules what i'm going to do is i'm going to divide this by m times g m times g and m times g and as you can see this mg gets cancelled so i get potential energy in h this m gets cancelled so i get one half uh, v square divided by g and then here i want you to understand this gets cancelled this gets cancelled uh, what you have here is you have rho which is kilogram per uh, uh, meter cube so basically if you see here p divided by you have rho and g that gives you h so basically this equation becomes p divided by rho divided by g so this becomes p divided by rho divided by g so what that means is if you have a fluid flow through pipe energy can neither be created nor be destroyed so total energy at point 1 is equal to total energy at point 2 total energy at point 1 is going to be h1 plus 1/2 v1 square by g plus p1 by rho g is equal to h2 plus 1/2 v2 uh, square by g plus p2 by rho g this expression is called as bernoulli's equation and bernoulli's equation is the conservation of energy principle and if you want to expand this further then you will get something called as the navier stokes equation but remember this now what this all has to do with the pressure measurement so what i want you to understand is imagine that you have this pitot and static tube you have this pitot and static tube okay what you have is you have this fluid that is at some velocity a uh, v2 so this fluid is at some velocity v2 and what are going to happen is this is exposed to atmosphere so the p2 value is going to be zero so it has some velocity because fluid this a tube is in the free stream the velocity is v2 but as this air comes in contact with this tube as soon as it goes here at this point this point is kind of fixed so as soon as this incoming air at some non zero velocity comes in contact with the stationary piece the velocity drops down to zero which means v1 is going to be zero please understand this height h2 and this height h1 is at the same level so what's going to happen the pressure here would increase so pressure p1 will be greater than p2 so what has happened v1 became zero but p1 increased so i can write down the bernoulli equation just like 1/2 v1 square by g plus p1 rho g 
H1 and H2, they are at same level. So I have V2 square by 2G plus P2 by rho G. P2 is zero because it is open to atmosphere. V1 is zero because it is stationary. So now I can find out the air speed V2 by this equation, which is V2 is equal to uh, 2 P1 by rho square root. So I multiply this over here and I get the value of the air speed. So that's why what you see is if you see a plane, you will see out of the plane, you will get this long tube that comes out of the plane. That is doing this. You cannot measure air speed any other way. If you want to measure the air speed, you need to have this pitot static tube. For helicopters, usually you wouldn't see the pitot static tube. Because please try to understand the assumption here that the flow is laminar. It means the flow is like smooth and laminar. But if you have a helicopter, then what you have is you have the rotor downwash that is actually disturbing this flow field. And that's why you do not get a good measurement. So what they do is, I don't know if you have seen Apache. The Apache has this long pitot static tube where the tube extends and goes out of the rotor downwash. So Apache, they used the, the pitot static tube. So barometer is used for two reasons. Barometer is used to find the altitude and the barometer is me measuring the differential pressure that is giving you the air speed. So that's why you have these uh, two. So just a second. Uh, yeah, barometer. And then again, you can see the MEMS uh, uh, pressure sensors. What they have is they just have a diaphragm. And again, the diaphragm deflects, the capacitance changes, and you can measure the change in the capacitance. Sometimes on that diaphragm, you have strain gauges, the diaphragm deflects, and that strain is an indication of the differential pressure. And this is how you measure the altitude. The only problem here is that since we are dealing with air, the density of the air is dependent on temperature. Uh, that's why you will have to add the temperature correction so as you can see that again that there is a correction factor which is actually talking about the change in the temperature but at the end the Bernoulli's principle is extremely useful in solving uh, the fluid mechanics problem and I don't know uh, have you seen this experiment okay I want to I, I don't know if you have tried this and don't try this so if you if you have uh, an 18 wheeler uh, driving uh, on 202 uh, at say uh, 65 miles an hour and if you have a small car you are trying to uh, drive again at 65 miles an hour and if you try to change the lane so you try to change the lane basically you would notice that as you try to change the lane you get pushed towards the 18 wheeler and the reason for that is what happens is the differential speed causes the differential pressure and the differential pressure pushes the car towards the 18 wheeler. Same thing happens. Imagine, I don't know if you have seen, if you have two spears, something like this, and say, if you blow air through this, these two spears come closer. And the reason for that is as the air passes through that small area, the velocity of the air increases, the pressure decreases. So pressure here is less than the pressure surrounding. So you get uh, these spheres, these come close. So please keep this in mind. Uh, that is extremely important when you are looking at aerodynamics. How do you measure altitude? And again, uh, 
please understand the change in the altitude even though for practical purposes that we assume it to be linear but uh, it's not really linear is dependent on temperature and again dependent upon the gas laws so there are some correction factors and one thing i want to tell you and remember this this bernoulli's equation all this stuff is good as long as you are subsonic okay if your aircraft is flying at very low max speeds bernoulli's equation is good p tot static uh, tube is good as soon as you cross the sound boundary as soon as you go at mach 1 as soon as you go supersonic all the bets are off so what that means is please try to understand that's why your rocket engines have diverging nozzles you don't have converging nozzles so basically all these is valid uh, in subsonic region uh, at low mach numbers but as soon as you you go hypersonic uh, the the bits are off again this is the airspeed measurement that i quickly talked about that you can find out the differential pressure and relate that uh, with the external uh, velocity of the incoming air and you use magnetometer so basically magnetometer is like a compass and what happens is the compass is aligned with the magnet earth's magnetic field and we can use that earth's magnetic field to find out the heading the problem with magnetometer is the magnetometer has soft ion and hard ion errors i don't know if you have tried this with iphone if you try to use the iphone uh, maybe for uh, uh, magnetic measurement sometimes it will tell you that you need to perform eight type motion like do it eight and the reason for that is it's compensating for the magnetic anomalies in the environment because as soon as we are next to the ferromagnetic objects magnetic objects the magnet uh, do not work properly and they need calibration so that's why you have a magnetometer uh, again what you need to do is uh, you need to use the rotation transformation to actually correct the magnetic field because please understand magnetometer is going to measure the field with respect to earth and you need to correct it to find the actual heading of an aircraft so for that, you will have to use the rotation transformation that involves roll and pitch to find out the actual magnetic field in the body coordinate frame. Yes. So would this uh, have to go with every like, direction, so including like vertical and horizontal, or is this just horizontal point towards your know, horizontal? So, so basically, magnetic field will give you val values of three magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic field in the x direction magnetic field in y and magnetic field in z but please try to understand that if your magnet is aligned uh, perfectly flat no roll no pitch then basically it's measuring the yaw so you can measure the yaw like that but as soon as you have your magnet which is oriented like this first and foremost you need to make this magnet straight and flat and then measure the field so that you can find yaw so once again if you have magnet which is just flat if earth's magnetic field is in this direction you can measure the magnet the field what it is measuring and find out the angle like using my and mx so find the just like component of gravity you find the component of earth's magnetic field in magnet's x direction and y direction the problem is if this magnet is oriented like this then first you what you need to do is whatever you are measuring you need to make it flat and then you have to find the angle so first you can what you need to do is you need to measure the magnetic field in the body coordinate frame use the transformation remember we have an imu that is giving you the values of theta and p and then finally you measure the heading or the yaw and uh so the problem with Earth's magnetic field is it's not constant and usually every year it changes slightly. So what you have is you have something called as the magnetic declination, which is out of alignment with the true magnetic field. 
and this data is available. So whenever you are using a magnetometer, usually depending upon the GPS coordinates, uh, you perform these corrections. Uh, next part is again, uh, Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Uh, you have to make corrections based on where you are. And this is where the GPS actually helps. So that brings us to the next question, GPS. How does the GPS work? Uh, GPS itself is a very complex system. It stands for Global Positioning System. The idea is you need to measure X, Y, Z and time. So you need to measure four uh, elements. So what you do is you have the GPS satellites that are revolving around the earth in certain orbit. You emit the radio signal. That radio signal encodes the information on the time when it started or originated. You have the receiver. That receiver will capture that signal, measure the local time and multiply velocity times time it took delta t and find out the distance between the satellite and the receiver. The problem here is the GPS signals, they bounce off of different walls. They have multipath, there is jamming and signal inconsistency. So because of that, you need redundant measurement. So to be honest with you, if you are trying to solve the value for four variables, x, y, z and time, you at least need four measurements. So you need four satellites. But what we do is we have more than four satellites. We get redundant measurement. And then what we do is we solve the least square problem. At the end of the day, GPS uh, determination or position determination using GPS is a, is a linear algebra problem. So basically you have multiple measurements and you are trying to find out the best possible solution. And again, we can use the techniques that you use in linear algebra to find the solution. And again, what you have is, you have something called as the pseudo range from the GPS. GPS has a lot of errors, multi-plot, troposphere, ion sphere, satellite clock. So nowadays, what we do is, we have something called as the real time corrections, RTK. Uh, RTK is like you have a base station and that base station can actually calculate since the base station is stationary. We exactly know where the base station is. So the absolute ground truth of the base station is known. It can get the GPS signal and based on its ground truth, it can actually send out the corrections that other GPS receivers in the vicinity can use and correct the GPS. So RTK is very, very powerful and you can get millimeter grade accuracy if you design your system properly. So you have a receiver that is fixed. You know exactly where that receiver is. The, you know the location accurately. That receiver is going to capture the signal from the satellites and it's going to calculate its own position based on the satellite information and use its true value to correct those measurements and send those major corrections to the local receivers that are moving. Now, here is a problem. To get a good RTK, you need to be within 10 kilometers. So it means you need to have a base station within the 10 kilometers range. As soon as you go out of the range, the corrections are no longer valid. So what has happened now is nowadays they use something called as the L band. So basically you have one more satellite, which is not at the, uh, at the orbit of the GPS satellite, which is a little bit closer to the earth. And this base station sends the correction to the satellite. And then that satellite uses something called as the L band, which is much more robust but it's not, it can't go too far. So it uses L band and those L band corrections or point perfect corrections are sent to the GPS receivers. That way you don't need to be in the 10 kilometer range of the base station. So depending upon where you are, you will get the satellite corrections on L band and then you can still get RTK even though you are away from the base station. 
So that is something uh, beautiful. So I would sincerely encourage you if you have interest in that, read about the RTK L band corrections uh, and how to use it. So how do you correct GPS measurements? And then again, you have, uh, believe it or not, theory of relativity plays an important role when you are correcting in the GPS because uh, the, the distances are astronomical and the relativistic effects, they play an important role. And so what is the implication of relativity? Time slows down. So if your time slows down, then your distance calculation is not going to be accurate because the measurement of time in the satellite and measurement of time on Earth will be different. And um, imagine that radio signal is traveling at the speed of light, which means a teeny tiny error in time will give you significant variation in the distance. So you have to compensate for the relativistic errors. So relativity comes in the picture, satellite clock, ion sphere, turbo square, multiplot, receiver measurement, and all these errors you need to correct before you can use the GPS errors. Uh, GPS properly. There is again something called as the dilution of precision, which is nothing but a measure of accuracy. And then basically you find the horizontal dilution of precision or nominal uh, vertical dilution of precision. And please understand uh, that is some, some sort of a major where you can trust GPS or not. And total GPS error is computed in terms of the horizontal dilution of precision and vertical dilution of precision. And basically you would have uh, UERF RMS. So based on that, you will have an estimate how far or how close you are uh, within the, the, the GPS uh, denoted or described position. So your HDOP and VDOP should be as low as possible. And there are GPS error models, and you can do your entire PhD on GPS error models. It's a Markov process. It's a random process. So you basically have a mathematical model that describes this random process, and then you use corrections uh, and, and you use sophisticated filtering algorithms for corrections. But here is the key. GPS signal gives you relatively accurate distances or location over a period of time. GPS signal you receive maybe 10 times a second. IMU signal you receive 100 times a second. But IMU signal is drifting. So what you do is you combine this GPS signal and IMU signal together to get the best possible solution for your altitude and your position. And that is what is called as GPS and IMS integration. If you are really interested in it, uh, there are three types of integration possible. One is something called as the loose coupling, which means you have the IMU solution. As you get the GPS solution, IMU solution is corrected. As you get the GPS solution, IMU solution is corrected. There is tight coupling. Rather than getting the solution from the GPS, you get the ranges measurement. And then you use that range measurement to correct IMU at low level. And there is something called as the ultra tight coupling, where you get access to the GPS internal clocks and receiver and range pseudo ranges that will make your solution much more accurate. But let me tell you, the ultra tight coupling, uh, you cannot work on ultra tight coupling as a civilian because you don't have access to those codes. You need special access to those bands where you have those corrections. Typically in the civilian environment, you can go up to a sort of loose coupling, but with RTK, you can get accuracy of ultra tight coupling with loose coupling because you have a base station. But one thing I would tell you, it's extremely easy to jam a GPS receiver. You can build an Arduino uh, uh, RF transmitter that will jam the GPS receiver. So what now they are doing is they are looking at G how can you do anti-spoofing, anti-jamming GPS signal. 
at one time when i started they were they were looking at celestial navigation so look at the stars find and use star trackers and then find where you are nowadays newer systems are looking at how to combine the celestial navigation with gps with imu and come up with better and robust navigation solutions so markov process is basically a random walk type of process and as you can see it over the time drifts but we want to design the signals uh, processing algorithms that can compensate for that and believe it or not at some point in your simulation we want to add the sensor models and then we want to add the state estimations so this weekend i'm going to add uh, the few more parts to the simulation that you have been working on but before that let me ask you this everyone has the mavsim working final okay then what i'm going to do is i'm going to assign the next few homeworks next few projects wherein we will perform we will trim the aircraft we will design the autopilot we will add the sensor model and then we will add the kalman filtering now i will stop here